just out in JAMA Network Open is a new paper that you need to know about, particularly if you care about long COVID. This paper about long COVID does something that other people don't do. They actually collect patient reported outcomes and they actually have a control arm. You see, that's a departure from other people who are in this space. There's a group that does veterans affairs data. And what they do is they look at veterans who happen to have a PCR documented COVID-19 infection within the VA system, which isn't all the veterans who got COVID. It's a subset of veterans who have sought the care to get the test at the VA. And then they link them to ICD-10 codes, which are absolutely worthless and not actually a measure of how people feel or function. These authors do something better. This is an important paper. It's called the Association of Initial SARS-CoV-2 Test Positivity with Patient Reported Well-Being Three Months After a Symptomatic Illness. And it's very clever because they take a lot of people coming in to get a COVID test. And these people have some symptoms that have prompted them to seek the test. And they're going to compare people who tested positive for COVID versus negative for COVID. They had something else. They had a usual upper respiratory tract infection. And they're going to follow these people into the future and administer patient-reported outcomes and health-related quality of life questionnaires to see what happens to people. So we'll finally be able to separate long COVID from being able being sick with something other than COVID. And that's what WISC and colleagues do in JAMA Network Open. Now, it isn't perfect. It isn't a perfect study. I'm going to talk about some of the limitations, but it's a whole lot better than the kinds of studies that I've been reading. Here's what they call it, the Innovative Support for Patients with SARS-CoV-2 Infections Registry or INSPIRE. It's to prospectively assess. See, they're actually following people and collecting actual information. They're not looking at ICD-10 codes. They're collecting actual patient-reported outcomes. And they're doing it in a three-to-one ratio. They want three SARS-CoV-2 diagnoses for one typical URI, and they're going to follow those people three months into the future. This is the interim analysis. It's the first thousand people. Put it another way, you can take a look at the consort diagram. 4,000 people consent to this study, 1,400 people are enrolled, 1,000 are analyzed, 700 people with COVID-19, 278 with a different viral infection. And that's what they're going to look at here. There are differences between these two groups, and that's one of the limitations of these studies. Not the same exact people in the world are getting COVID-19 and getting other respiratory tract infections and seeking care at the same place. But there's some sort of factors that may go against one group and some that may go against the other. Let's talk about that. So table one is huge in this paper. It goes through many, many different variables that are different because no one is randomly assigning somebody to blow COVID in your face or blow rhinovirus in your face. So they're going to be different people. And table one is loaded with differences. What are some of those differences? That if you had a non-COVID diagnosis, you were more likely to be non-white, more likely to be unmarried. You had a lower annual family income. You had public insurance. You're more likely to be unemployed. And you were more likely to have a higher prevalence of moderate or severe asthma. What about the group of people with COVID-19? Participants in the COVID-19 positive group reported more symptoms at baseline, more head, ears, eyes, nose, and throat symptoms, and they were more likely to be hospitalized for COVID-19 for their symptomatic illness than people who didn't have a COVID-19 diagnosis. So, you know, these are people seeking care in the same setting. And for many other analyses, we do treat these people, test negative controls, as if they were similar to people who had COVID-19. Here, they're looking at something different. What are their long-term patient-reported outcomes? What do we know about long COVID? And I'm going to talk about how we can frame this, knowing that they're slightly different people, and that's the great limitation of this study. You're not going to get around that unless you want to actively infect people with different viruses, and you're not going to get around that. Here is the take-home figure, figure two. The first three categories, they show you higher scores are better, baseline, when you came in with the illness, and then three-month follow-up. Higher scores are better, the arrow is pointing upward, and the right the right five categories, lower scores are better. Let's walk you through cognitive function. COVID-19 patients come in at baseline with slightly higher cognitive function, and it gets even better in three-month follow-up than people with a different virus. Their physical function has a bigger improvement with COVID-19 than a non-COVID-19 illness, and social participation goes up a lot better with COVID-19 than a non-COVID-19 illness. If anything, it looks like getting sick with a upper respiratory tract infection other than COVID is worse for you. It looks like it's worse for you. And what about anxiety, depression, fatigue, sleep disturbance, and pain? All of these things look like they are worse. Lower scores are better. They're worse if you have something other than COVID-19. Now, okay, you are going to say these are apples and oranges, not exactly the same people. Some people may have come in with more symptoms. Those are probably the COVID people. And other people may have a different demographic variables that may predispose them to sort of long-term symptoms or having a tougher recovery. That's definitely true. But here's the take-home point. 
COVID-19, long COVID, it's supposed to be like something you've never seen before. It's going to shrink your brain. It's going to obliterate your sperm count. It's going to do all these terrible things. And if that were true, that even with all these differences, you should still see huge, huge differences. And COVID-19 should be way, way worse. But if anything, it looks like roughly they're all in the same ballpark. Yes, some people get better right away. Some people have a tough road to recovery. I will reiterate what I've always said. I have not yet seen any credible evidence that somebody with mild or asymptomatic COVID-19 does any worse than they had they had mild or asymptomatic rhinovirus or influenza or RSV or whatever. And it's certainly the case that somebody with severe COVID who gets on the vent and somebody with severe influenza has a long path to recovery. It's always the case that if you get really sick, you have a long road to recovery. But it's never been the case that you can get an asymptomatic respiratory virus and your brain will shrink. And if your brain is shrinking, I worry it's shrinking when you're reading the paper about the brain shrinking and not actually from the virus. Here, I think you can say roughly there is a long path to recovery. There's no clear evidence that having COVID versus a non-COVID illness is dramatically worse. It's not dramatically worse. And I think you can say that despite the caveats of the differences in population, it's not a different animal. It's not a different beast. It shouldn't be profiled in the Atlantic, okay? It's, it's, it's more or less roughly the same as any upper, upper respiratory tract infection. Although other studies have found that those who recovered from acute SARS-CoV-2 infection are at increased risk of an array of mental health disorders in the subsequent year, participants in the current cohort experience similar rates of dyspepsia symptoms at baseline and follow-up regardless of initial COVID-19 status. It didn't seem to matter. The presence and persistence of poor mental health among nearly one in four participants may reflect a more general pandemic exposure, which participants in both group experienced, because 27% of the people in the COVID in the non-COVID group, sorry, yeah, in the non-COVID group had it, and 21% in the COVID group. And so the inclusion of a control group allows us to see that a lot of people are suffering. And why are they suffering? It's not the virus invading the brain cells. It's what we did in response, which was disrupt all of the things that make human society thrive and flourish, like concerts and movies and education and socializing, all that disruption. That's not good for anxiety or depression. And the bottom line is here, there's no clear evidence COVID-19 is worse. They write, Similarity in observed changes in both groups may be reflective of the experience of being ill during a pandemic when access to care was hampered by pandemic restrictions, and also life itself, potentially slowing recovery regardless of the underlying infection. These broader pandemic impacts therefore call up for increased attention to mental health services irrespective of SARS-CoV-2 status. That's a reach, actually. You need to prove to me that the routine application of the services actually can improve things. Okay, that's another thing, but their point is well taken. There's no clear evidence here that COVID-19 is worse than a non-COVID-19 illness. In their limitations, they put this one, this analysis included participants through September 2021, so findings may not be applicable to more recent infections. But if anything, COVID has gotten a lot milder. I mean, we have Omicron variants now, so it's, this is probably the worst case scenario. It's going to be better now. Fourth, COVID tests may yield false negative or false positive results. Yeah, of course, there could be some people who are misclassified here, but it's hard for me to believe that it's going to be the bulk of people. And again, all of these outcomes are roughly in the same ballpark. I'm not going to say that COVID is better than upper respiratory tract infection. I don't think this study proves that, but it does prove to me that it's not catastrophically worse. And that's the media claim, that it's catastrophically worse. It's not catastrophically worse. It just isn't. Conclusion. In this cohort study, SARS-CoV-2 infection was not associated with worse physical, mental, or social well-being as measured through patient report outcome scores at three months follow-up compared to no SARS-CoV-2 infection. This is an important paper. It does some Something that the veterans group doesn't do, which is use prospective data, prospective controls, measuring symptoms and how people are doing, and not ICD-10 codes, which are used for administrative bullshit. They're used for administrative bullshit, and they're not useful for research. This is a good study. VIA study is no good. Long COVID, you got to do some proof. You need some more evidence before we, I'm going to believe that asymptomatic or mild disease leads to persistent long-term symptoms beyond what would have happened with a routine upper respiratory infection. So you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Jamma, on, Jamma Network Open. Jamma Network Open publication. I'm going to put the link below. Until next time.